corrupted time. We live in a very confusing time. We, we live in a really a stressful time. My wife and I, we talk so much about these things when we're driving. Last, last night or yesterday, we were walking and we were just talking or, or riding our bikes and we were talking about it. And we were just talking about, you know, we're, we're just living in a day that for the believer, there is clear sight through the confusion. The Lord's coming. I mean, it, unequivocally, the Lord is coming. I don't know today, tomorrow, the next day, or in, maybe not in my lifetime. I believe he's coming soon. But there's a lot of confusion and uncertainty. And what we need to walk in, in, in all of the clouded and shrouded frustrations, as believers, we need to walk in the peace of God. You know, Paul said in the peace of God that surpasses or transcends all understanding will keep your heart and your mind through Christ Jesus. And it's one thing for the world to be so confused and so frustrated. But I'm watching believers and, and I'm hearing posts and, you know, reading posts and seeing things that, that we don't need to worry about. We need to just walk in peace and, and, and the prosperity of a right relationship with God through Jesus Christ. Amen. We, we don't need to walk in, in fear and, you know, it's just the, the enemy is just laughing, you know. Either he's got people afraid of this or walking in foolishness over this. You know, I talked to, Lori and I last night, I talked to a lady in our church, one of, one of the more precious saints you'd ever want to meet. Um, I can say her name, Barbara Guyani. She hadn't been, we hadn't seen or heard from her in, in uh, months after months, and we've been trying to reach her. And uh, last night, she called me back. Hadn't talked to her personally in six months. Got text after text that wasn't reaching. She said she's 83 years old, wonderful saint of God, and it moved my heart. She said, Pastor, I had COVID. And she almost died she said uh, I decided I wasn't going to the hospital she said I stayed home and said father God you will take care of me Amen. better than anyone now, you talk about confidence you talk about I mean Lori and I are sitting there I had her on speakerphone and I mean just tears and are just moved by by this great faith and she, she's from Columbia and she speaks in such a beautiful, beautiful accent and dialect in the way that she communicates. And she just said, this is the real deal, but God is greater Amen. and God is mightier. And she said, and I trusted God. And I said, God, don't let this move to my lungs. And she said, and I'm getting stronger. And I thought, oh God, give us all that kind of faith and confidence and in favor and reassurance you know John said in in first John 5 and 14 and this is the confidence that we have in him that if we ask anything according to his will he hears us and if he hears us then we know that he grants the petitions or the request we make known unto him He's saying that when we have that kind of relationship, we can talk with God in such a way that we pray according to his will. And in that, we don't waver one way or another. We just walk in an unwavering reassurance that God is still on the throne and that we as believers, no matter what we see, we're not walking by sight. We're walking by faith. We're not living by circumstances but we're living by the certainty of a confidence that says, I don't know about the politics. I don't know about the human rights problems we're having and all of this stuff. It's an atrocity in what's taking place. And, and, and I don't know who's going to be elected, but what I do know is that God is still on the throne and that Jesus Christ is still saving the lost and that the Holy Spirit is still working on the behalf of, of every believer to reach ultimately the lost for the cause of the kingdom of God. 
this I know, and I know that God loves me and that nothing will ever separate me from the love of God which is in Christ Jesus. If you believe that, would you give him praise right now? Hallelujah. Father, help us. Help us. Help us to have this kind of confidence. When you walk in a right relationship of confidence, you don't have to convince anybody. You don't have to type another thing on Facebook. You just simply walk in who and whose you are. You are the salt of the world. You are the, the light of this world, salt of the earth, and you are the light of this world. And you don't have to declare anything. All you have to do is live in who you are in Jesus Christ. Amen and amen. We need to stop getting disrupted over all of the things that are going on and just walk in that faith and that confidence of Jesus Christ. Amen and amen. God bless you so very much. Um, that cost you nothing. Just a little something I wanted to add this morning that God laid on my, my heart. Walk in that confidence. Amen. Walk in that reassurance. Now, I want you to turn with me in Genesis the third, thank you guys, thank you so much. Uh, how many, would you just give me just a, a big offering of appreciation? Uh, I want to thank Ben here in the drums this morning. He is um, Mike Peterson's son. And uh, we were kind of hamstrung a little bit. And he came in and filled right in for us this morning. Would you let him know we appreciate Ben so very much? Amen. Did, a, did a, just a phenomenal job, praise God. So let's get back into the message now. We, we've been talking for the last few weeks. I'm going to continue here uh, this week. We've been talking about the keys of life, and ultimately we come out of Deuteronomy 30 and verse 20 where he said, and this is the key to life. And we talked about in that, that Sunday that we love God with all our heart. We put him first that we follow after truth, and that we pursue God's purpose. You know, Christ, in that powerful, powerful prayer of John 17 in the fourth verse, as he's praying and talking to the Father, he said, Father, I have glorified you on this earth by doing all that you have required of me. It is so important that we understand that our life is a life that is called to bring glory and honor to the Father. In fact, if it glorifies you, if it honors this church, or it lifts up this preacher in any way, it is not within the will of the Father. Amen. Everything that we do should glorify God. Everything that we say should honor our Heavenly Father. Every way that we walk, every witness, every work that we do, our finances, our families, our faith, all that we are should honor God first, amen. The Holy Spirit is come into this earth not to speak of himself, but to speak of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And so in that, these are the keys to life. So we talked about some of those things, and we talked about the decisions that we make. Now we're going to uh, continue on. Last week, we talked about living the dream and how that God gives us things, and he gives us dreams, and he gives us vision, and, and he gives us uh, a spiritual hope in our life, and that these things should guide our life. They should drive and motivate our life. And we started talking about Joseph and how that out of what God began to give to Joseph, Joseph kept those dreams and and those, those hopes and those visions alive so that one day God would use him. Let me tell you, when we look at this area of dreams, we need to look at the end as well as looking at the beginning and recognize that God, when he gives these, these spiritual illuminaries into our life, these dreams, these visions, these thoughts, these hopes of, of something, that there should be an end purpose that, that there should be a cause and effect and that ultimately the way God would use Joseph would be to deliver his people and to bring blessings. Ultimately, everything we do should be about what is God's cause, what is God's purpose, what is God's plan out of our life to bring glory and honor unto his name, into his kingdom. Can you say amen? So we, we pick up 
with Joseph, and we talked last week about there's three areas. We talked about the first area, a dreamer's uh, design, and how that out of his dream, he began to recognize things about what his life was designed to be. Didn't happen till he put the, the favor of the father on, that, that, that coat, that special design of the father. When that happened, it represented the father's favor. And when we accept Jesus Christ, it is by the grace of God we begin to recognize the Father's favor in our life. We start thinking different. We start walking a little more reassuredly. We start uh, talking a little bit different, not arrogantly, but confidently in knowing who and whose we are in Jesus' name, amen. We don't have to, as we said, we don't have to look down and, and be embarrassed about things. We can look up with confidence knowing that greater is the power of God's spirit and love in us than all the things we're facing in this world. We don't have to prove anything. Everything was already proven on Calvary's cross. So we talked about that. We talked about how the dreamers keep dreaming and their dreams get bigger and the dreams just continue to grow deep into the future. So this morning we want to talk about two other areas, and that is a dreamer's detour, and we want to talk about a dreamer's destiny. Ultimately, God's wanting to use what he placed in you. He wants to get it back out of you. Amen? Amen. You know, when we were fearfully and wonderfully made, according to um, Psalms 139 and 14, the Bible said in there, the 13th verse, that God was there putting things in our life when we were in our mother's womb. God was putting the things in not just so that we could have feel-good experiences and be big and strong and make money and do all. God was putting things in because ultimately he knew what he wanted to get out of your life. Amen. Amen. He knew what he wanted to use your life for and what purposes he wanted to bring about from your life. So we pick up again in Genesis 37, and I want to read verses 5 and following. If you found that, would you just stand with me in honor of God's word this morning? So in Genesis 37... Uh, Verse 5 and following. Now, God, uh, his father has already given him the coat. He, he's already blessed him, and, and uh, he's already favored him. And now in verse 5, the Bible said, And Joseph dreamed a dream. Now, now remember this. Before then, Joseph never dreamed any dreams. J Joseph didn't have uh, any real visions. He didn't have uh, any kind of spiritual imagination of what was going to happen in his life. But the father favored him, and now because of this, he's starting to dream dreams. And Joseph dreamed a dream, and he told it his uh, brethren, and they hated him yet the more. And he said unto them, Here I pray you this dream which I have dreamed. For behold, we were binding sheaves in the field, and lo, my sheep arose and stood upright, and behold, your sheaves stood round about and made obeisance to my sheep. Now I'm just telling you, if I had a little brother and I don't, and he started telling me things like that, I'm a little ticked off as well, Amen. I'm like, what the what? Who do you? <laughs> Listen, boy, I'm going to whip you, you know. Uh, verse 8, and his brethren said unto him, shalt thou indeed reign over us? Because you have to remember, not only was he out of line with this, he was out of culture. Everything was, was, was out of sorts in what he was saying. Uh, and, and I tell you right there, there are things about your life. God doesn't have to follow any cultural plan to bless through you and use you. God can raise you up in a moment where others said there was no way anything would happen out of your life, and God can touch you and anoint you and use you in a mighty way. Somebody needs to hear that right now. And uh, he said, and his brethren said, shall we indeed, uh, shall you reign over us? And shall thou indeed have dominion over us? And they hated him yet the more for his dreams and for his words. And he dreamed yet another dream and told it his brothers and said, behold, I have dreamed a dream more. And behold, the sun and the moon and the 11 stars made obeisance to me. And he told it to his father and to his brethren. And his father rebuked him and said unto him, what is this dream that you have dreamed? Shall I and your mother? and brethren indeed come down uh, come and uh, bow down ourselves to you on this earth verse 11 and his brethren envied him and his father observed everything that he was saying father let the uh, anointing just 
be upon us today, Father. I pray let the words that I speak glorify your name and let us hear, respond, and receive. God, I just believe there's someone in this house, somebody's online right now that needs to hear this, Father, because you, you are wanting to bring them into a place of destiny and use them beyond the scope of what they've already thought, Father. Now let that just flow in this house, in every church in our community that names the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. And amen. God bless you as you are seated in his presence this morning. So you look through the Bible and you see uh, all sorts of visions and dreams and, and uh, just the stimulation of what God's spirit and God's heart do, has, has done through those from, from an uh, Abraham to a David to, to a Daniel to, to a Joseph to a, a Paul or the Apostle Peter uh, to you to me to, to, to leaders that have gone before us and to yet leaders that will go after us. And it is out of these dreams and out of these visions and out of these spiritual perceptions that God moves in us and motivates through us that we would live these dreams and live these purposes and live out these plans because God wants to bring us to a place though that for a while we don't understand it and for a great season there is tremendous confusion but ultimately God is, is shaping us in that design to get us to a place of great purpose, to the place of his plan. And sometimes we try to interpret these things in the right now of what's going on in our life, and it can't be seen or understood. It's often confusing, and we talk about it, and we only irritate others because it doesn't seem to make sense. Can I tell you right now, God's way is above our way. His thoughts are above our thoughts. His plans are beyond our plans. And his ways are past the scope of our finding out and discovering these things. God knows the beginning from the end, the first from the last, but yet we don't discover it till we get to that place. It is our job, it is our place as a follower of Christ, as a Christian, as a believer in the things of God that we simply walk in faith. We walk in hope. Though we have an uncertainty about the circumstances, we have a confidence about who we are and whose we are in Jesus Christ. Amen. We know that he's with us. He'll never leave us. He'll never forsake us. The writer of Hebrews says in Hebrews 13, so that we can boldly say, the Lord is my helper and I'll not fear what man shall do, what circumstances shall do, what situations shall do, what the things around me shall do. No matter what is going on, we are going to live the dream. We are going to walk in peace. We are going to live in purpose. And we are going to be prosperous to the things of God by the power of God in our life. If you believe that, give him praise in this place this morning. And you know, there's a level that when it starts out, I'm, I'm just going to surmise a little bit. You can feel the excitement in Joseph. You can feel the motivation. I don't know, but uh, I, 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 like, I, I like the dream. I, you know, I like what's going on in him. And so, you know, you can just feel that uh, Joseph is saying kind of like, hey, guys, you help me out with this. He wasn't really asking for any help there. He was just sharing with them out of the excitement. Have you ever shared the excitement of what God is doing in your life to those that don't understand the things of God and they look at you like you're crazy? Amen, you start talking about them and, and you start using kind of this church and biblical terminology that we use. And it's kind of within our group, right? Our little church group that we use. And we start using this about being saved, saved from what, you know, and being born again, life transforming, sanctified, and all these things. And, and, and those that don't have those kinds of experiences and dreams, they kind of look at us like, are they speaking a different language? What's going on? And see, Joseph is telling them things. They have no understanding to what's happening. In his youthfulness, he's sharing these kinds of things. He's excited about it. I just sense that Joseph is really excited. God is speaking to me. I don't, I don't know what all of this means, but it, it feels good. Amen? You know, there's times I've been in services and I said, I, I came to church, I wasn't sick, but I feel like I left healed, amen? There's just something about just God doing things in our life. 
So, you know, the first part of that, he's beginning to discover his design. You know, he's feeling really good. But how many know that things begin many times in our walk in Christ, and they start feeling really good? And all of a sudden, it goes from the mountain to below the valley in one fell swoop. I mean, things just change. Many are the afflictions of the righteous, but the Lord delivereth them out of all. You know, Paul said in uh, 2 Timothy, I think it is in 3 and 12, he said, yea, all those that live godly, I would love him to, to just have gone and said, we'll, we'll have peace and prosperity all the days that they live. And then what he said, he said, yes, all those that live godly will suffer persecution. Do what? You want me to give everything? You want me to give my life? And I'm still going to go through it? Uh, you know, you call me to preach and I'm still going to have uh, uh, resistance and struggles, God? Absolutely, amen. But it is out of that strain, it is out of that stride, it is out of that struggle that comes to us that it will shape us into what God is preparing us for so that we'll be ready when God's ready to use us, amen. Some of these things that we go through are simply there to shape us for what we're going to. I know that that had to have come out right. And, and there's depth to what I believe God is saying. You have to know that what's happening in your life is not just lost in the moment. God is getting your life ready for something greater. He's getting your life ready for the dream that you're living, the hope that he's placed inside of you. He's shaping you and all of these things. You feel like, God, what is going on? He is simply the potter is getting us ready for the many things he wants to use our life for. So now... Joseph is at this place, and we finish here talking about the dreamer's design, but now we need to talk about his detour. Joseph went through some detours. How many has ever been through a detour in your life, spiritually, emotionally? Uh, absolutely. When you, when you look at this thing, you realize, if I could kind of expedite this a little bit, Joseph is having these dreams. He's telling his brothers. He's telling his father. He's telling people, anybody that will listen. He's out there talking to the sheep. I mean, I'm making this up, but, you know, I just feel like, Joseph, have you ever been alone with God and start talking any and everything around, you know? I mean, you're talking to God, but if anybody was around, they'd think you're nuts. I really need to see your hand about right now. If that's Yeah, amen, amen, amen. You know, so many times I, I, I'm out or I'm walking and I'm just talking, oh God, you know, just like he is standing here because he is right here with me. And all of a sudden I'll look up and somebody will be doing their yard. <laughs> Keep him away, he's nuts. Or, or even praying in the Holy Spirit, that really freaks him out. And you know, and, and a lot of times is when I'm praying in the Spirit, I'm, I'm looking around and not thinking, but I'm not looking up and all of a sudden somebody will be on the same sidewalk and they're like, you know, they just, they, they don't get it. So there, there's a sense, you know, Joseph, this is going on, but his brothers don't take kindly to it. Ultimately, you know the story. His dad sends him uh, uh, down to uh, Shechem, and at Shechem, he discovers his brothers are down at Dotham. He ends up down at Dotham. They're caring for the, uh, the sheep, the animals, and so forth. So he's just going down there, you know, he's going to see how things are. You know, kind of a David principle, going to check it all out, you know. And he's just happy as can be, and, you know, it's all cool, right? He gets down here and the whole time he didn't know his brothers are on a slow burn. They see him from a distance and they start planning. I'm going to tell you, the enemy is constantly planning your demise. You need to understand. I mean, and the problem is you start arguing with that. You get caught in the scrum of it all. You need to just let it go. Just get off of Facebook. Get off social media. Stop arguing with people. Don't argue with the blind about what you see. Hello? Go home and read John 3, 16, 17, 18, and 19 and understand that you can't sit there and condemn a blind man for not talking to you about the beauty of the sunset. Amen. And we want to get in there and argue about all of these things where the truth of the matter is they don't have the enlightenment that we have and walk in in Jesus' name. Amen. So he's coming down, his brothers see him, and they say, oh, there's that dreamer. We need to take care of that. Ultimately, you know what happens. They take him, they throw him in the pit, they bloody his coat, they show their father later on and said, you know, is this his coat? Yeah, and he thinks he's dead. But, but there's a band of Midianites, Ishmaelites, passing through. They sell Joseph off to them for 20 pieces of silver. He ends up, so he comes out of the pit, the short moments in there. He doesn't know what's happening. I mean, I thought I was a servant of God. Don't raise your hand how many you're serving God 
everything's going well, all of a sudden hell breaks loose in your life, and it's like, but where's God? What's going on? I mean, I'm at my third funeral in four months. What's going on? And Joseph ends up in, and, and now he's in Egypt. Potiphar, the captain of the guard of Pharaoh, he, he buys Joseph, and now he brings him on as a, as a uh, servant. Uh, he sees the favor of God over his life. He raises him up. He puts him over everything uh, in his household, and ultimately for 11 years, he's serving there. And I mean, it's like paradise. What? This is really, really going on. Joseph's enjoying it, but here's the bottom line. God did not put the dream in him so that he could enjoy the prosperity of Potiphar's house. He put it in him so that he could rule and reign and so that he could ultimately bring his people to a place of freedom, amen. Let me just pause right there and say, there are too many of God's people that have paused in their dreaming. They have paused in their visions. They have paused in the illumination of what God's spirit, and they're saying, you know, this is good enough. I go to church on Sundays. I, I, I give some. I do this a little bit. I think God's pleased. But that's not what you were designed to do. God designed you for things of destiny and deliverance and to bring glory to his name and deliverance to the nations of this world. Give him praise this morning. Amen and amen. Ultimately, you know the story. Potiphar's wife takes a liking to Joseph, and, and finally, you know, he, Joseph just, she tries to get a hold of him in the house. He turns and runs. His coat comes off. She grabs it, and now she concocts a whole story that he came in and tried to defile her and all of these things. And now Joseph's like, what is going on? Just about the time I think I'm there, I'm dropped out again. God's got a plan. Say to yourself right now, God's got a plan, amen. It's not over yet. It's not finished yet. I mean, you might have went down once, twice, three, four, five, six times, but it's not over, amen. A just man falleth seven times, and he rises up again. God's going to bring you up again. He ends up in prison. Everything looks bad, and, and ultimately, he's in a place of great uncertainty. He's in a place... Of detour everybody goes through detours we've been through detours but there's two things you need to grab a hold of quickly first of all he doesn't know they're coming secondly he's not prepared all of a sudden you're driving down the road and there it is detour yesterday we we're coming to Stephen and Brittany's wedding and all of a sudden with, without any warning we're going down to 528 and I don't know if they closed the front part of the road and Lori says, get off at Cimarron, right, right here. That's where I get off. I said, no. You don't tell me how to drive, woman. <laughs> I didn't say that, but <laughs> two accidents happened right there. No. And so I said, no, we'll get right through this. 35 minutes later and her saying, I told you, I told you, I told you. I told you, I told you so. I wasn't ready for it. I wasn't. It, it just happened all at once. Can all the men say amen? amen. It just happened. Amen. It wasn't my fault. Amen. Joseph, it wasn't your fault. It just happened. He's blindsided. I'm just living the dream, man. Just going all of a sudden, there's a detour. Life takes a turn. Things shift. I didn't know corona was coming in and I was going to lose my job or, or this was going to happen or these things. It just took a shift. He wasn't ready for it. That's life. Stuff happens. We're ill-prepared for the events of tomorrow. But I'm not worried about my readiness as much as I am confident in what God can do, amen, with every turn and situation. Let me give you a couple of things under that quickly. First of all, favor brings opposition. He got a coat. He got favor. The Father's blessing him, and problems follow shortly thereafter. Dreaming requires risks. He starts dreaming, and his brothers start hating him. The Bible said in verse 4 of 37, they couldn't even speak peaceably about him or with him. They're saying things. They're frustrated. You know, it's the climate of today. Let me tell you something. You start talking about Jesus Christ, you make people mad. 
I mean, the bottom line is you're with him, you're against him. You're for him or, or you're on the other side. There's no middle road. You can talk about God. You can talk about Allah. You can talk about all this other stuff. You can talk about the Bible a little bit, just a little bit. You can talk about church. But you name the name of Jesus Christ and they go nuts on the Internet. They say, well, well, man, they, they prayed and they used the name of Jesus. That offends me. Let me just interject and I'll get back on topic. I really don't care if it offends you. Christ came to divide to where you are either going to be offended or you are going to be changed in your life. And some people need to get offended so that they can get saved and accept Jesus Christ as their personal Lord and Savior. And people coming up, when you say there is, that Christ is the only way, you watch the interviewers on, on different broadcasts, CNN and different ones, and they all the time, they'll go when they, when they interview a, a preacher or a faith leader or whomever it is, and they'll always come to this question. Would you say that Jesus is the only way to get to heaven? And the moment that person says yes, they begin to attack him. Well, what about this person? Is this little grandma going to go to hell? Is this one going to go to heaven? What's going to take place? And the bottom line is this, that Jesus Christ is the only way. It's not good works. It's not living a good life. It's not going to church. It's not giving the most money to help this world out. It's got nothing to do with anything about heaven. But when you accept Jesus Christ, and you come to a place where you simply repent of your sins and accept his righteousness, you are now on the pathway to eternal purpose to make heaven your home. Can you say amen and amen? Opposition. He made a mistake. He dreamed a dream and he told it. Contrary to custom, contrary to culture, contrary to everything. They hated him all the more for two reasons. One is because of his coach, because he dreamed a dream, and really, ultimately, because they didn't have a coat and they didn't have a dream. I'll tell you why people will get upset with you, because they don't have a dream and they don't have the favor of the Father. You start saying things like, oh, God has blessed me. Well, you don't think God will bless me? Well, <laughs> he created you. He birthed me. <laughs> I'm an heir of God in a joint heir. I'm sorry about it. Sorry about it, as my granddaughter Harper would say. Sorry about it, Papa. Just the way it is. Don't mean to diminish you. You could, you could have that favor, but you choose this humanistic approach to life, just, just saying you could have the coat, you could have the dream, and ultimately they just started hating him because he's so blessed. Let me, let me just tell you, when I was a kid, when we were living in uh, Fort Lauderdale, Florida, down there on that east coast, you had a lot of New Yorkers, we, we had New Yorkers, we had, we had a lot of uh, Cubans, and we had a lot of Jewish people that were down there, probably still down there, and uh, I, I'm just being honest with you, man, I, I learned to hate Jews, I hated them, I hated them, I would start fights with them, I would make fun of them. I would, I would belittle them. I would call them names I would never repeat again in this life and, and just constantly do things. I, I made fun of their nose. Lo and behold, I get one of those big noses too, you know. You know, I did a lot of different things, but you know what? I look back, and obviously I've repented, and I, I realize as chosen people, I pray for uh, Israel. I pray for Jerusalem. I pray for the Jewish people. I love them. I bless them. They are blessed, and, and we bless them. But I realize all it was was jealousy and envy. I just hated that they lived in the better houses. I mean, we had a shingle roof and they had a tile roof. You know what I'm saying? You know, I mean, you know, we had single car garage and they, they had like four car garages. And I'm thinking, who needs four cars? Who needs four car garage? They, they just seemed to have everything and I couldn't figure it out back then. So instead of just looking at them and being blessed for them, I just learned to hate them. I just learned to say, you know what? I don't even like these kinds of people and ultimately we come back to the realization when you walk in the in a in a dreamer's life opposition is going to come and then never expect enlightenment from the unenlightened the bible said in first john one and seven but if we walk in the light as he is in the light we shall have fellowship one with the other 
See, we're walking in the light of the revelation of Jesus Christ. So there's certain understandings. I'm communicating to a people, basically, that, that we're on the same wavelength a little bit spiritually, right? But you start talking about spiritual things to unspiritual people, and they get kind of all bent out of joint, and they don't understand it. Men without a dream don't understand dreamers. People without vision don't understand visionaries. They want to live a status quo. They just want to live in the real existence or this mere existence of life. There's this basic, I just want to fit in instead of living the dream. When someone says you can't do it, that simply means that they can't do it. When they say it's not going to happen, they just simply are saying because it's never happened with them, it can never happen. People attack what they don't understand what do you think racism is anti-semitism is uh, misogynistic attitudes uh, sexual bias what do you think all of these things are they are hatreds and they are bigotry towards people they don't understand people that they're confused about people that their minds simply say they can't be as good because they're not like me and somewhere out of that they learn to attack and that's what happened with Joseph if you go back to the beginning notice where they attacked him they attacked him where the father had blessed him at his coat the story in the pit is they took the coat, they bloodied the coat, and they said, you're not going to have that favor anymore. You're not going to have that coat anymore. We're going to take it from you. I'm here to tell you this right now. Nobody can take the favor, favor of the Father. Nobody can take grace from you. There is neither height nor depth nor principality or power nor things present nor things to come that shall ever separate you from the love of God which is in Christ Jesus can you say amen? amen? The enemy will attack you at the place God has blessed you. He'll attack you at your ministry. He'll attack you at your marriage. He'll attack you at your calling. He'll tell you it can't happen, it won't happen. Through the years of life in ministry, Lori and I have had so many undue attacks right in the ministry. People that have loved us have hurt us. I mean, when you feel the knife in the back and you look it's into the hilt and you, you see that it's held by the hand of somebody you've prayed for, you know the enemy's at work. And there's this, this destruction the enemy is trying to bring and to destroy the blessing in your life. And people are so sensitive. Well, they didn't even thank me for, for serving Sunday morning. Well, they didn't even tell me uh, what a good singer I am. Well, they didn't even appreciate me in front of everybody. And all that is is the enemy stirring up and attacking you at your blessing. He's attacking you at your dream. He's attacking you where the Father has favored you. Well, they didn't even they put it in a bulletin that, that I, I worked at the outreach this week. Do you want the blessing and the favor of man? Or do you want the blessing and the favor of God whereby you did it not unto one another, but you did it as unto the Lord? Because God's rewards are greater than any applause we'll ever give here on earth. I am serving for the applause of one, and that is the applause of my heavenly Father that one day I'll walk into heaven by the blood of Jesus, and he'll look out and say, well done, thou good and faithful servant. You've been faithful over a few things. I'm going to make you ruler over many things. Come on and give him praise in this house. They attacked him at the place of blessing. Notice when they attacked him. He's 17 years old. He's just a young man. The enemy knows if he can stop you now, he may stifle the dream. He may hinder the flow. He may get you at a place where you go a little bit and give up. But he knows if you ever get traction, if you ever get to the end, if you ever get to destiny, there's no stopping you. Joseph, I got to stop him now. Because if he ever gets all the way to the palace, he's going to cause me untold problems. I'm telling you, you are fearfully and wonderfully made. God put dreams and visions in your life. There is a destiny in your life. 
and the enemy's trying to frustrate you along the way. He's trying to say, yeah, people don't even recognize. I don't need you to recognize my calling, by the way. I don't need you to tell me whether I'm doing the right thing or not. Uh, my, my God and the Holy Spirit is enough, amen, and my wife to tell me, right? <laughs> and she is my best friend and my greatest help. But in that, we talked the other day about so many people that have started the race and that they've turned and they've, they've given up. They walk to the side. It's time to get back into the race. It's time to get into the dream again. It's time to get back into serving. It's time to put your hand back under the plow and understand that the enemy is trying to get you, uh, unseat you from where you need to be because there's a day coming that God wants to use you in a mighty and a glorious way to bring glory to his name and to bring salvation to the nations of this earth. Number three, uh, notice what the attack brought. It brought detours. It brought delays. It brought discouragement. But I'm going to tell you what it didn't bring. It didn't bring defeat. It didn't bring denial. It didn't cause him to give up. He kept living the dream. He kept holding on. It's kind of like the Apostle Paul in 2 Corinthians 4, 8 and 9. He said, I'm troubled on every side, but I'm not distressed. I'm perplexed, but I'm not in despair. I'm persecuted, but I'm not forsaken. I'm cast down, but I'm not destroyed. Paul said, I've been going through it. I've been struggling, but I'm still strong. And that's what happened with Joseph. He went through all the trials and the tribulations, but he kept living the dream. He kept holding on to the key to life, and that is that God was with him, and that as long as he kept loving God and putting God first, that ultimately he was going to get to the place that God had called, designed, and destined for him to be. Let, remind, let me remind you that the pit, Potiphar's house, and the prison, they were all detours. And detours are but temporary moments. I've never been on a permanent detour driving down the road. Now, there's a few times, I've got to be honest with you, Lori and I have been in Miami, that town is one big detour, it feels like, at times. And buddy, when you get off one road, God help you if you get off at the wrong road. I told you, we, we ended up in Liberty City where there, was, there wasn't Liberty. <laughs> I, I, don't, I don't know. I don't know if it was the red car, the blonde wife, or whatever else it was, but it didn't feel good. <laughs> You better come to the piano. I got to get going. Don't be pushed by your problems. Be led by your dreams. Somebody needs to get that. Your problems will shove you all over. But we need to be led by our dreams. Understand, a man with his dreams will always outlast detours. Others are just frustrated. Next time you hit a detour... Just pause and say, I'm just passing through. Amen. I'm not here to live. I'm just passing through. I'm just, I'm not here to stay. I'm just passing through. There's been, Lori and I have been through some crazy little towns. We ended up one, one day, we had a flat tire. We ended up in Corinth, Kentucky. Has anybody ever been to Corinth, Kentucky? I don't want to offend anybody, but don't go to Corinth, Kentucky. We were supposed to be there 45 minutes and 12 hours later. I thought, I am going to die and go to heaven from Corinth, Kentucky. In fact, I don't even, I don't, my, my attitude was such by the end, I didn't know if I would, where I would go. <laughs> Corinth, Kentucky. But it passed. We held on. We held out. We encouraged each other. My daughter would look at me, and my son was there, and my daughter said, Daddy, are you sure we're supposed to be traveling here and moving up to Ohio? And I said, I know we are. She said, Daddy, you don't feel like it. Daddy, it's all right to say we made a mistake and go back to Fort Myers, Florida. I said, baby, this is just a detour. It's just a short time. But we're going to get through this. You can outlast your detours. You can outlast your difficulties. You can outlast your discouragement if you'll live and hold on to your dreams. Secondly, when detours have come and gone, a dreamer will still have his dream. 
Sometimes the only thing we got left is the hope that he's placed in our heart, and that's all you need. Amen? I've seen people lose and make and lose again fortunes, but they still had God. Back in the um, days of the Great Depression, he's a very wealthy man in California. He also had a farm, had a lot invested in stocks, very wealthy. He lost everything. He lost everything. All he had was that farm. He sold that farm and he gave every dollar to charity. His close friend said, you are a fool. He said, that's the only thing you had. He said, no, you're the fool. I never owned that farm. He said, I own that farm now that I gave it to God. Let me tell you something. You can lose everything, but you're still a wealthy man. You're still a rich woman in Jesus Christ. Don't sell your dreams. Don't sell your destiny. Don't sell your hope and the visions that God put in your life. You may be on a detour, but detours are not forever. Dreams are forever. The endurance is to bring us to a place of destiny, of where God ultimately will have us. I'll pick up on that last part maybe next week. Some of you this morning, you may feel like you've been on a detour for some time, and you, you probably are. You know, some detours God designs in our life. Some detours are because we didn't ask for directions. <laughs> Has anybody ever done that? I'm talking in the natural. But we've also done it in the spiritual. We've also made decisions that we left God out. We bought things that we shouldn't have bought. And then we, then we end up on financial detours. God, when I get these bills paid, I'm going to start tithing again. Let me tell you something. Obedience to God is not contingent upon your mistakes. I'm sorry, I didn't hear you. Amen. Lord, I'm, I'm going to start going to church. I'm just going to be really honest with, with my, my heart lately and the word. I'm going to start going to church when we get past all this corona thing. Really? Can I be exceptionally honest? I need some help here. <laughs> if you, I understand if you're at risk. I do. I understand if, if you're like my mother, 88 going on 89 years old, and, and you have to be exceptionally careful. I understand that, albeit I've got several 89 and 90 and 92-year-old people in here this morning. I understand that. But what I don't understand is how we can go to the restaurant if you do, don't post that picture on Facebook. It's just, it's hard on your pastor. And I'm looking at you drinking a glass of tea in the restaurant with your husband. And, and the first thing I do, I'm sorry, I'm fleshly, I'm human. And I say, Lori, is it me or they can go there, but they, you know, or you're at Walmart or you're shopping or we can go all over. We can, we can go to Cold Stone. I went there last week. God is at Cold Stone. Just a side note, I'll tell you how crazy we are. I'm, I'm moderately lactose intolerant. I wasn't as a kid, I am now. And anytime I eat Cold Stone, I get sick. And Lori says, why do you do it? And I said, it's so good. <laughs> and I don't get a small, I get a large every time, albeit we split it. Just dumb things we do. I don't understand. And we're on this, this I'm out of church and I'll be back sometime in the next year. No, no, you won't. Now is the time to make a faith decision. Now is the time to stand up and say, now again, I, I'm very carefully, I'm not talking to those at risk. 
I'm talking to those that you're just making decisions. Are you praying about that decision? What kind of detour have you put yourself on that God's trying to get you back into a place in a pathway of destiny so that God can use you like he wants to use you? We can't throw these last six months away. We can't throw these last four months or next four months away. We can't just flush them down the toilet and say, well, I'll catch up with you, God, in 2021. God is right now wanting to use you. He's wanting to save souls through your life. He's wanting to grow you. Oh, I'm getting all I need at home. No, you're not. We struggle even when we go to church sometimes and the enemy's fighting us. You can't tell me eight months of sitting home, you're better off than you were when you came to church. We need one another. Forsake not the assembling of yourselves together. Amen. These things are detours that the enemy designs for us. There are God detours. There are enemies detours. And there's detours that we create. Decisions we make money we spent, people we marry. You're living with that detour forever now. How many would say, no, I'm teasing. I'm on a marital detour. What do I do with my detours? I'm going to give you a couple of things. Thank you. Keep praying. Just keep. You, you may be in a pit. Don't raise your hand. How many feel like you're in the pit right now? Everything's again. You may be in a place of, of false accusation and frustration. You may feel like you're in the prison. You may feel like you're in the worst place. But I'm going to tell you something. As long as God is with you, I would rather be in the worst place with my God than the best place alone. I don't want to be in the castles that this world can give all alone and without God. I'd rather be anywhere with God than everywhere with man. See, and that's what we have to understand. You say, you don't know my life. I don't have to know your life. You don't need me to know your life. God knows your life. God loves you. And if you've made some bad choices, and if you got off onto some crazy things in your life, it's all right as long as you'll stop and recognize it and say, God, I'm coming back to destiny. I'm coming back to those dreams. I'm coming back to those visions and those hopes that you have for my life. Here I am. Use me again. If that's you, just stand up right now. Lift your hands and say, God, I'm coming back to destiny in the name of Jesus. Come on. I'm coming back to dreams. I'm going to live my dream. I'm going to live what you've given to me. I'm going to live out what you have laid inside my life in the name of Jesus. Come on, all over this place right now, you and God, start worshiping. If you're with your spouse, grab their hand, lift it together, and say, God, we are one in Jesus' name. If you're with your best friend, grab his or her hand and lift it and say, together, we're coming off of our detour. We're going to get through this. We're going to come into destiny, and we're going to live out what God's doing in our life. Come on. Worship him. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. We've been in, in detour long enough. God, take us. Take us on a path to destiny. Come on, sing it again, sing it again, sing it. with praise the spirit your of confidence
me tell you this real quick. Lori and I got here this November would be 12 years. We got here by way of detour. This is very much a part of destiny. Very, very much for us. I mean, we never stayed anywhere longer than four years. Seventh church we pastored, and we've been here 12 years. So that's got to mean something, right? Destiny. It was detour that brought us here. We were pastoring, having a time of our life. Dreams, visions. Just built a beautiful new house, 3,400 square foot on the lake. I had a dock, even had a little boat out there that floated and ran. Hey, and, and you know what? I just want everybody to know that boat out there. It's leaving. It's sold. It's gone. No, no, you don't, you don't clash. There's a good amen and a bad one. It breaks my heart. Yeah, all right, all right, all right. I heard all of it. So, hey, things went bad. I'm not here to blame. No matter who is involved, there are friends. We love them at all. It's all over. But here's the deal. It sent us on a detour. To where next thing you know, we showed up in Tampa, Florida. A friend of ours had a little kind of an outreach house, little 600 square foot house with bars on the window in a, in a really rough area. I remember one night we were sleeping and all of a sudden, Lori and I woke up. We could hear the police right there. Stop, you're in direct violation. I thought, oh my God, we're gonna die. It was like cops, you know, bad boys. Bad. And we're laying there, not allowed to go back to our house, not allowed to go back to the church have no idea of our future. The, the overseer said, you need to be an evangelist for a while. I said, I'm, I'm not called to be an evangelist. That's not on my dream list. I don't evangelize that way. I don't go to church to church. I'm a pastor. That's who I am. That's, that's what God put, checked the box with. So for the next five months, I'm calling pastors. Hey, I didn't even know how to do it correctly. Hey, you know, it's like, hey, can a brother get a service at your place, you know? No, 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 it's Christmas time. And it, I mean, there's a few just golden pastors in this state that said, John, come and preach. They never even heard me preach. I go there to evangelize, and all I could do is pastor them and preach. And we just cry together. Oh, I love you too. Just on detour. And then about six months into it, we get a call, and the overseer says, please go take a church down in Avon Park. That's right, man. Joel and Debbie and their son and daughter-in-law. And it was a church that had some real issues that were on a bad detour themselves and God married us together for a year. And man, you talk about healing, you talk about destiny, you talk about God doing things. And, and that's another story altogether. And through that, God brought us right into this place where we were supposed to be all the time, but we would have never got here had we not went on detour. And it was out of detour that we come into this place of destiny that is an everyday experience. I'm going to tell you, some of your greatest difficulties are but detours. God taking you to the greatest place in your life. If you'll let him, if you'll hold on, if you'll keep dreaming, if you'll keep believing, if you'll keep holding on, you are going to get to where God wants you to be. You know, when he was talking about the detour and going to Avon Park, have we not gone to that detour? We needed that too heal us. We didn't go there for them. They were there for us. Because without that detour, we had to heal to come to sanctuary to be able to even stay this long. Because that was God's plan. It, was. it wasn't planned for us to hurt. But through hurt, healing came. Amen. And that's why we're here today. Amen. And I'm going to tell you something. It wasn't all of our friends coming around us and hugging us and saying, hey, John, Lori, I'm glad it's worked out for you. You know what they did? Because we had pastored a, a large church. And then we went to a church about 30, 40 people at that time because they just went through a tremendously difficult time. And you know what our friends did? And I love them, but they made fun of us. You're out in the country in that little old church. And they joke and say, has God forsaken you? And our only comfort was with one another. And then the people in that church loved us back. They helped us back to where we needed to be. I'm telling you right now, God wants to encourage you. All over this place, if you feel like you've been out on a detour, just slip your hands. I won't pray for you. Just slip them up, turn them up. Open your heart, Father, right now. God, I pray for those that have been on a detour. 
those that have been confused, those that have been through it in their life, those that have been in a place of great struggle. I pray God today, this morning, right now, God help them to hold on to that dream again. Open their spirit and flood their heart. God, destiny is not over. That God, they're in the middle of a place of destiny. That God, you're taking them this pathway to fulfill purpose in their life. God, we pray this right now. Give us peace and help us to know even in this time, we are prosperous in the name of Jesus. If you believe that, would you give him honor right now? I pray that for everybody online right now. Stop with COVID detours. Come on, don't let this terrible disease get a grip on you with fear and keep you from being what you should be. One last question and we'll be dismissed. Is there anyone in this place right now, maybe somebody online, you don't know Christ Jesus as your Savior? Maybe you've drifted away and you're ready to come back this morning. If that's you, just slip your hand up. I want to pray for you right now. Pastor, I want to, I want to rededicate my life to Jesus Christ. Many did last week. Are there any here this morning? Maybe there's some Maybe there's some online right now. I just feel like there'll be those that are watching that God's speaking in their heart. God has a dream for your life to make heaven your home, and it's only going to happen through Jesus Christ. Would you pray with me, church? Here's what we need to do. If you're online, I want you to just pray this prayer. Pray it aloud, church. Father, I come to you in the name of Jesus Christ, the Son of God, and the Savior of the world. I confess that I am a sinner and I cannot save myself. I acknowledge Jesus as your Son and Savior for us. I ask Christ into my heart for the forgiveness of sin, that today I'll be a Christian. I'm restored, I'm renewed, and I'm saved in Jesus' name. Fill me with your Spirit. Give me a path of purpose, a life of destiny, from this day forward, in Jesus' name I pray, amen and amen. Praise God, praise God, praise God. If you prayed that online, just text, or if you have any need, just text JESUS to 407-993-1411. God bless you. I love you so very much. Um, I think they have one more announcement. God bless you. Let's have an awesome week. Hey, next week, don't run out on me. For next week I've got a guest speaker and I'm gonna tell you his name is Bill Lee this guy is a tremendous preacher who God has used he's a true evangelist God has really used him all over the world come invite a friend invite a neighbor I believe God's gonna to touch you in a mighty way amen I love you and I bless you have a beautiful day in Jesus name